couple of things I want you to notice about this chapter before we start reading this morning. First thing, the time frame, we're going to find out when we start reading in verse number one, that Israel's under captivity, but then if you study it out, everybody remembers the story of Daniel on the lion's den, right? Before that, everybody remembers the story about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Okay, they remember the story about how Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in. They overthrew Israel. They took them off into captivity. Well, y'all don't really realize the amount of time that transpires between all them events. Okay, Chapter number one of the book of Zechariah, we find that Darius, Darius, however you want to say it. Okay, I'm a hillbilly. But Darius is now king. That wasn't the king that came in and overthrew Israel. Israel's been under captivity for a while now. Okay, Anybody remember the story of Esther? How she was wed to King Ahasuerus? Well, that was Darius' mama, was Esther. Right? Esther was married to Ahasuerus when, when they were under captivity. This man's grown now. It's been a while. Okay, not only that, you study it out. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. By the time we get to Darius, you know which crowd Darius is associated with? The Medes and the Persians. That means that not only was Israel overthrown, Babylon was overthrown, and Israel's still in captivity. Right, can you imagine? praying Lord I pray that you'd overthrow Babylon and he does but the other part of the prayer wasn't answered and let us go free that's why they prayed for the overthrow of Babylon it's because they wanted to go back home they wanted to be Israel again they didn't want to be reigned over and lorded over they remembered Daniel lived to be an old, old guy go study it out but Daniel, throughout all of it, didn't matter where Daniel was, Daniel's heart was always pointed in which direction? Toward God. Right? Why do you think he faced towards where God's temple was back in Jerusalem before they destroyed it when he bowed down and he prayed every day? That's where his heart was. Didn't matter where his body was, his heart was never moved. Okay, it was still stayed upon the things of God. But, verse number 1 of the book of Zechariah, In the eighth month and the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of Hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Then we're going to stop reading there. Zechariah gets a very bitter word that he has to go deliver to the people of Israel. Right? We know Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, we know that he preached, Repent, judgment's coming. Right then we get the book of Lamentations where he sees the judgment that God poured out upon God's people and the broken heart that he has to see what's happened to God's people knowing that it happened because of their choice. The book of Lamentations nowhere right, does it diminish God's authority, God's right to judge God's people. It never once questions God's decision to do so. The book of Lamentations is from a perspective of why in the world, when you knew that this was going to happen, 
Did you walk into it without changing anything? Right? Well, Zechariah gets a message to deliver from the opposite perspective. He gets the message, the way that you are today is because Israel's never repented. You know why Israel was still in captivity under the Medes and Persians just like they were under the Babylonians? They never repented. They never turned. They never got back spiritually to what the so often in the Old Testament, right? The vows of, that, of their espousal, right? The first promises that they made, which were, we're going to serve God. They forgot those and they embraced so many other commitments. But now Zechariah, he gets the message, go tell him one more time. Look, if you will, verse number five. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? A question that God gives to Israel. He says, do the prophets live forever? No. That's why God has to keep raising up another one and another one and another one. But all the prophets that have been heard says that they're gone. Now, we can go and study out what happened to a lot of the prophets. Many of them were persecuted. Now, you do know that's why Elijah the Tishbite was out in the wilderness wearing camel hair. Right? It's because they tried to cast him out of society. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. The king, every time, hey, we ran into a fella, said he talks to God. He did some amazing things. He said, what do you look like? Well, he was wearing camel hair, and he goes, ah, it's that Elijah again. It's that crazy fella. It's the one that we tried to kick out of town, right? They were persecuted. They were mocked. They were ridiculed. Not all of them died a martyr's death, but a lot of them socially were martyred. They were made to look like the man who was on the outside. Now, we don't associate with him. Even after Elijah on Mount Carmel, you don't remember it. God sends fire down from heaven. All the people say the Lord He is the God, but there's still some so stubborn that they wouldn't repent. They had to kill them. They were the prophets of the of Baal and the the groves. You say, why did those men die? Because they would not repent. Before irrefutable proof that God was stronger than Baal was. And they made the wager. They said, yep, sounds good to us. If your God's stronger than our God, we'll worship your God. And God proved that he was, and then what'd they do? They still didn't do it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? The prophets, they all have the same message to a different group of people. What's that? Return. 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 The prophets were made to look like socially, right, outcast. Knowing that what they preached was the overthrow of Israel, right, captivity and bondage, the thing that God let them out of with Moses, with Moses from Egypt, right, it would uh, count for a loss of everything that they had. You do realize that that's what captivity means. Whatever you own, somebody else now owns, including you. They weren't going to be citizens. They weren't going to be equals. They were going to be the lowest in the class system. Well, verse number one, we already said it's the second, second year of the reign of Darius. Several rulers have already come and passed. Throughout all of it, Starting with Nebuchadnezzar. There's some that took a stand and said, nope, we're going to do what God said. As Daniel and three other Hebrew boys. They wouldn't eat the food of the king that God would have considered tainted, unclean. God rewarded them for it. In fact, Daniel gets elevated to a position of a judge over a gate in the entire king. By the end of it, he's the prince of all princes. By the end of the book of Daniel, he was second in command. Echoes all the way back to that fellow that had a coat of many colors that God ended up being second in charge to only who? Pharaoh. Right? God takes the 
Small things to do what? Big things to confound the wise. Well, Daniel just stayed close to God. God elevated him. You know that Daniel served under Darius? He's still around at this point. The prophets may be gone, but the works of God are still evident. You know why Daniel got to where Daniel got? Because Daniel trusted God, served God, loved God. That's the only reason that Daniel ended up where Daniel was. You know why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, you know why those fellas ended up not only walking out of the fiery furnace, but why those fellas were used of God as an example of what God can do? Because they trusted God. They feared God more than they feared a king. They served God before they served any man. And as a result of it, God elevated them. Go study it out. But even with all of that evidence, even knowing that God could use somebody like Esther to change the heart of a king and save God's people, keep an evil man from doing evil things unto God's people, because that happened during this captivity period. God's people still would not admit that they needed to get back to where God was. Their hearts, in chapter number 1 of Zechariah, are no different than when their hearts were when they fell into captivity. Many of them have forsaken God, and they have no desire to return to the things of God. Verse number 2, he says, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. That's an indictment on those that came before. Your fathers are the reason that God's disappointed with Israel. And he has been displeased with them. That's why you find yourself in this situation. Then, verse number 3, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. You know who he's declaring has said this? The very God of heaven, the Lord of hosts. Right? Jehovah. That's what capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament means. That's the very name of God. Abbreviated so that the Hebrews wouldn't, in their opinion, commit sacrilege and blasphemy by uttering the name of God with a human tongue. That's what that L-O-R-D in all caps means in the Old Testament. He's saying, Jehovah, the God of heaven, says unto you, if you turn to me, I'll turn to you. You know what that verse means? The reason you're still in the situation you're in is not because of your fathers, it's because of you. He said, you were born into this situation, you fell into this situation because the Lord was sore displeased with your fathers. But he says the reason you're still in the situation is because you haven't learned from their mistakes. You need to turn. If they had done nothing wrong, what would they have to turn from? And you do know that that is the literal definition of the word repent, to turn from something, to forsake this in order to embrace something else. When the Old Testament says that God repented of what it was that he had planned to do, that does not mean that God apologized for it or God was wrong from it or wrong for it, and meant that God chose to not do the evil thing to instead do grace or to show mercy or to embrace or to accept their obedience. does not mean that God was wrong. It means that God turned from it. That there was no chance he would go back and do it because he had repented of it. But it says if you repent and turn to God... God will repent from what he's put you in and turn unto you. Captivity was never meant as a permanent thing. It was meant as a thing to get Israel to turn their hearts back to God. I'll remind you, that's why what happened out there in Egypt. They got comfortable living on the land that used to belong to the pharaohs because of what their ancestor had done and listened to God to help stave off the worst of a famine. 
People forgot about what Israel had done, and Israel had not separated themselves from Egypt. They had ingrained themselves with Egypt. They had turned their back on the ways of God and embraced the ways of Egypt. That's why captivity was allowed to come. Because nobody remembered that boy who used to be a Jew. They were just people living on land for free. There was nothing that separated them from the Egyptians in life and practice and worship. Nothing. It took captivity for 400 years for people to remember who God was and what God had done for their people in the past. And that maybe he'd just do it again. Well, verse number four, Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. He says, You know what I told them? Same thing I'm telling you. Turn. Repent. He doesn't say turn from your, you know, permissible ways. Turn from your socially acceptable. No, he says evil ways. Israel had stopped thinking of disobedience as evil, as sinful. They saw it as acceptable, permissible. They thought that they could do that and still be right with God. You can't be evil or do evil and still be on the same side as the Lord. But he says, verse number 5, Your fathers, where are they? It's a redundant question. They're in the ground, is the answer. They had already died off. But yet their disobedience still lingered. Does not the Bible say that sin shall be passed down to the third and fourth generations? Right? That the fruits and the labors of your evil deeds will bear fruit even unto your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, maybe even further. He says, where are they? They're gone, but you're still reaping what they sowed. He says, and the prophets, do they live forever? There comes a time when God says they've heard enough. And He removes the chance or the opportunity to get things made right. That's why it's so important that when we come to the house of God, regardless of what the issue is, if the Holy Ghost tells you to do something, you ought not delay. One, because of the two sins in the Bible, grieve not the Holy Ghost and quench not the Holy Ghost. But two, we're not promised tomorrow. And if God deals with you now and you don't do it, you're without excuse if God never gives you another opportunity to get it made right, we're not promised another opportunity to come to an altar. Just because you want to get it made right doesn't mean that God will prevent what's coming already. I'll remind you, Daniel was still right with God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego never find where they were crossed with God. But yet they were still among the group that fell into captivity. They got overthrown just like everybody else did. All those that were doing right, they still had to suffer the consequences. They may have repented that they fell into captivity. Oh Lord, I'm so sorry we failed you. Lead us out of captivity. They never got to the root problem. And everybody had to pay the price for it. Why is it so hard that we believe that if God deals with you about salvation, that it's important because you may never get another chance to believe on Him again. The Holy Ghost may never deal with you about that again. But yet we think that God doesn't have a point where the chastening rod of God comes out instead of the shepherd's hook where he's trying to pull you back. Right? God has a time and place for correction and you can't avoid it. Doesn't matter how much you tried to repent at that point, You've got to endure the correction so that God can drive out the disobedience from you. Correction's not meant to punish you. It's meant to shape you into more of the image of Christ. God has to break your will. Well, Israel's been suffering bondage for a long time now. 
but yet their will still has not been broken. They will not turn. They will not admit that they were wrong, that their fathers were wrong, that the prophets who had already been dead and gone. Just because God stopped preaching it doesn't mean that it still isn't true. It just means that God took away the opportunity for you to get it made right before something worse happened. But then it says, verse number 6, But my words, my statutes, which I have commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? He says, they were gone, but the words that I gave them still have power to this day. What they promised, it ended up happening. That, by the way, is the telltale sign of a prophet. Whatever they said actually happened. That God put the stamp of approval on what it was that they uttered. Because they didn't come up with it. God came up with it and told them to say it. But it says, Did not the words of the prophets take hold of your fathers? Meaning there was no escape. If something's got a hold of you, it means you can't get away. It means there's no escape. It says, and they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. You, he says, the words of the prophets took hold of your fathers, and you know what your fathers had to say? God was right and we were wrong. But yet knowing that God was right, they did not turn. Now I'm pretty stubborn. Okay? I inherited through my mother my grandfather's, you know, hard head, and I got my dad's stubbornness. Right? I could make a don I could get into a stubborn competition with a donkey and probably win. Okay? I get when you don't want to admit that you're wrong. But how in the world, when everything has been taken away from you, do you still, in the gable end of your soul, still believe? I'm not going to change. What did the fathers say? They said that everything that the Lord said, according to our doings, according to our wickedness, according to the evil that we had perpetrated, he said God did all of it. And yet it still says that they did not turn. Because he's telling them, Be not as your fathers which did not turn. I'm begging you to turn. Right, they had been returned to the very point where God had originally found them in Egypt. Captivity. They were slaves. They had free will, but they weren't free to do as they willed. What's that mean? They did what other people told them to do. Didn't matter if they wanted to wake up and go here or do that. They did what somebody else instructed them to do. So as I was reading these verses... saw a comparison between the United States and where Israel's at. You say, Brother Jordan, it's really bad now. It's going to get worse. I hate to tell you that. But so often we hear that America was founded on the principles of God, on the ordinances of the Word of God. That's true. But not everybody bought into that. You know that, right? After the Constitution of the United States was put into effect. Y'all know what the first military and armed conflict was over in the United States history after we set up what now we call the United States of America? It was called the Whiskey Rebellion. First time that George Washington ever had to assemble troops under the banner of the United States of America, it was over something called whiskey. According to your Bible, you know what that is? It's sin. There were many people that believed that God was the only one that could found a nation and establish a nation that would last for any length of time. They believed that the true and the just ordinances of the Word of God were the only place that you could build a true and just political, economic, or judicial system. They did believe that. But there was a whole lot of other people that didn't care what was going on down at the Capitol. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do on their land. So Washington had to march a whole bunch of fellas down there. There wasn't a fight. 
Washington showed up with a whole bunch of troops, and they're like, okay, we, we're sorry. <laughs> right, we didn't think that you'd really do it. And he's like, yeah, that's why I showed up. But there was threat of rebellion under what nowadays we like to boast is, you know, the greatest and the purest form of government that was ever started. It's been corrupted, and it's not what it used to be. Right, but we like to say, no, our nation was founded at the best start that you could have. And it wasn't a few years later, there's people saying, we'd rather have booze than be a part of you. We're going to start a rebellion. You say, well, Brother Jordan, compared to nowadays, booze, what do you think that mentality was? It was the mentality of, I'm going to do what I want to do, regardless of what... Washington, regardless of what Adams and Jefferson and all the rest of them, regardless of what God says, I want my whiskey and I want it the way that I want it and I don't want to be taxed on it and I'm willing to fight over it. That's the same mentality that Cain had. Same mentality that Lucifer had. I don't care what God said. I'm going to ex exalt my throne above the very throne of Christ. My will is more important. What are you saying? That's always been a part of America. Study it out. Things that have happened through American history. The things that nowadays we look back at and we think, oh, how in the world did that happen? It's because there's always been a group of people that wanted to do what they wanted to do. And they didn't want the government, they didn't want their neighbors, they didn't want the community telling them that what they were doing was wrong. They may not always have pulled guns out and marched and picketed and everything else, but they, sue the, they sowed the seeds. Why? So that one day they'd grow fruit to where you can't talk about me for doing this because of X, Y, and Z. It's always been that way since the beginning. That's why the Bill of Rights had to be added to the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, then later the Constitution. Okay? It's the only way Madison got elected was because churches said, you can write the Constitution however you, but unless freedom of religion and freedom of speech and all of those things in the First Amendment plus everything else in the Bill of Rights, said if you don't take care of us, we're not voting for you. We care about being able to worship God in freedom without fear of oppression or fear of rebuke or you know, military action against us. Because we care more about what God says than what you say. There is an etching of it on the wall down there. It's called Leland Endorses Madison. Go read the story behind it. That's how Madison got enough votes in order to make it into the Continental Congress and later become a representative. Then he became president one day. But see, just because some stood up and said, we're going to do what God said, not everybody did. Let's fast forward. Go back to the book of Zechariah. How many Israelites do you think were put into captivity? It was more than four of them. Right? It wasn't just Daniel and the three Hebrew boys that were thrown into the fiery furnace. It's all of them. But see, I don't find that anybody decided that, as a whole, they were going to reinstitute Old Testament worship. I don't find where people fought the system. They made themselves a part of the system. You know why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego caused a problem? Because they would not bow when everybody else bowed. These four boys weren't the only Israelites that were sent with that group to eventually become advisors under the King Nebuchadnezzar. That's what they were chosen for. They were known as the smartest, the brightest, the most intelligent. They had enough knowledge that they could give something to the king that he needed. I don't think that them four was the only ones that were sent from Israel. But they're the only four that we ever find doing anything. They were the only four that said, we will not partake of the unclean thing. They were the ones that said, we will not bow. And they said, we are not careful to answer the old king. They said, we don't even have to think about it. 
You know why they caused the problem? Because they would not conform. You realize that the world has no problem with you being here today, with you going out and talking about it, as long as you conform to their standards, to their overall goal, as long as you don't buck the system. You can talk about Jesus all you want to as long as you don't talk about them. You can do whatever you want to in your house, just don't bring it to my house. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but when it comes down to vote on important things, we need you to line up with the rest of us. How many Israelites had no persecution because they just fell into the system? They were overthrown and they, well, this guy's in charge now. We have to do what he says. That's not what God said. And God rewarded those that did what God said rather than what man said. And even with them as examples, they said, ah, it'll just be easier if we do it this way. Now, you do realize that the reason Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, again, I've said it before, you look and you study out the law that those other princes came and got the king to sign, it didn't say nothing about praying. It just said that you should not ask for anything from anybody other than the king for 30 days. We don't know what Daniel prayed. Daniel could have just been thanking God for what God did yesterday. Right? You don't know that Daniel asked anything of God. He could have said, Lord, I have no right to ask because of what you've already done. Right, but they didn't care. They just saw him praying and they thought, well, he must be asking for something. They dragged him before the king. They hoodwinked the king. Now they've got to throw Daniel in the lion's den. You know why Daniel was even persecuted in the first place? Because he did things righteously and the rest of them saw it as a condemnation upon themselves. They wouldn't have cared if Daniel was second in command over all of everything that the king owned if Daniel acted like the rest of them. If he was a backstabber and a heathen and he believed in false gods and he was worried about consuming and amassing things, you know why they feared Daniel? Because they knew they couldn't buy him. They knew they couldn't control him. They knew that he was going to say what God said. He was going to believe as God said to believe. And they didn't like that. I wonder how many other Jewish people by that point had worked their way into positions of authority. They didn't care about them. You know why? Because they had them in their hand. They said, oh, he'll take a bribe. He's going to do whatever we say to do because he's more afraid of us than anybody else. Right now, look at America today. I wasn't there, but I've read stories. Go back 50 years. Now, I firmly believe but I know the history and the backstory of a lot of people in the church. But a lot of us raised in church. And right now you're thinking, well, Brother Jordan, are you saying that our fathers were evil? No. Remember, I said Daniel got thrown in with the captive group just like everybody else did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were led into captivity too. We have no evidence that they ever did anything to displease God before captivity came. But you say, Brother Jordan, if they did things right, how'd we end up here? If we're doing things right, how'd we end up here? Because doing things right isn't enough. You do realize that the world was promised by Christ that they would hate us because we were different than them. Well, go back to the 1950s and watch as society starts changing. When you start seeing things on TV, I'm not saying TV's bad. I like TV. You guys know I'm a huge Star Wars fan. How could I like Star Wars and then also hate TV? Okay? That's why I watch it. But with the introduction of modern day advertising, with the introduction of television, then we get to cell phones, right? Not to mention radio before that. The world is inundating you with things 
And what is the goal of all advertising? We want everybody to buy into it. That's what advertising is. They want you to buy what they put on the board. Well, when everybody does that, you realize that people start looking the same. They start talking the same. They start being okay with the same things because they see it on the TV every week. And well, we still go to church, we pray every day, we do it. Yeah, but you don't look any different than the world anymore. You say, well, how in the world has fashion gotten to the point where it is that? Because nobody stood up and said, hey, that's dumb before. Right? Y'all ever see them food where people are like walking around wearing trash? <laughs> Why do people go to them things? Because nobody stood up and said, hey, this is dumb. I'm leaving. Because they go, oh, this is so, so avant garde. <laughs> it's dumb. Uh, you guys realize that the reason that gay pride parades keep happening is because nobody stood up and said, hey, how about the day before the gay pride parade? We have one called, uh, mm, name it whatever you want to. I don't want to get in trouble on the internet today. Okay. But how about we let people know what God says about it? Not about the people. God loves the people. We're talking about the decision, the action, the lifestyle. Do you know why that's as accepted today? Because well, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Do you don't think that Zechariah made people a little bit angry when he says, yeah, you can blame your mama and your daddy all you want to for where you were born or what situation you find yourself in, but the only person you got to blame for staying here is yourselves. Because that's what he preached. He said, you have to turn. It's not that they didn't turn. You're still here because you didn't turn. Now you go study under captivity. God does allow for certain... The temple is rebuilt. It wasn't restored to what it was beforehand, but the temple gets rebuilt. The wall is built around the city. Jews are allowed to return to their native homeland, but they didn't get back all that they lost. In fact, they is under bondage. You say, well, how long were they under bondage? Well, if you really study it, they never got out of bondage until when? In the 1940s. When Israel was restored as a nation and given to them for them to own and possess. Up until that point, there wasn't a nation of the Hebrews. They had always been under the rule and subjugation. Why? Because one generation... We're given the opportunity to say, Lord, we don't want to be like them. We don't want to be accepted by them. We don't want to be involved with them. We want to be in line with you. God gave them one more opportunity, and yet they still refused to turn. And what happened as a result of it? From that point forward, they were in captivity. Not for a time thousands of years not 400 years that captivity lasted longer than the first one did all the way up till the end of World War II you say Brother Jordan how serious is God about people turning back to what it was they were? why didn't they turn because they liked where they were you know why America is the way that it is? Because people like the way that they are. You don't know why churches don't go out and really take a stand against things? Because they're okay with the way things are on an individual level. Well, that doesn't affect me. Hogwash. You do realize we're where we are today because the moral compass of America and the standards of America have slowly been corroded over time. Your father's generation thought well that doesn't affect us that's over in California yeah but if part of the body gets sick eventually all of it's going to get sick well we can't change that over there no but God can he's just looking for people to stand up against it well I can't make a difference over there that's what the devil wants you to think well I'm just me 
Yeah, and Jesus died just for you. You're pretty important in God's eyes. Jesus would have died if you were the only one that believed ever. You're telling me that he didn't have a plan for you after you got saved? To do things that were great and mighty and worthy of what he paid for you? But no, we're okay with it. We don't accept it. We don't embrace it and make it a part of our lives, but we're okay as long as it stays over there. That's why you never find a lot of Israelites ever mentioned during captivity. Why? Because they just fell into the rhythm. They started dressing like the others dressed. They started walking like the others walked. They started talking like the others talked. They didn't even know that there was something unique about them because they had become a part of the other society. But if you stood up and said, now we're going to be different. No, we're going to stay the way that it was meant to be. We're going to stay what God intended us to be. Zechariah was raised up, even though the sins of the fathers had been passed down to him. He said, you don't have to be okay with it. You don't have to stay where it Turn. Turn today, and the very Jehovah God of heaven will turn unto you. That's what he promised. The same is still true today. You know why America stays the way that America is? Because people haven't started turning. Man's heart is not so complex that God hasn't foretold and forewarned about what will separate us from God. It's that we don't turn our hearts. And the only reason we won't turn our heart is because our heart likes something else more than what God intended for us. That's a me problem. That's not a California problem. That's not a Democrat problem. That's not a somebody tried to shoot Trump and assassinate him problem. No, that's a me problem. You know who has control over my heart? Me. You know why Daniel, when thrown into the lion's den, God protect him? Because his heart was as close to God as it was when he was thrown in, as God had always intended it to be. You know why a fourth man that had the image of the Son of God was waiting on the mother boys when they were thrown into the furnace? He just revealed how close he really was to them. He was always there behind the scenes. Why? Because they stayed close to God. And the son said, boys, I'm just going to walk in and prepare the place for you. I'll see you on the other side. They threw him in. What happened? Said they was walking around loose. I believe they was having a little case of the can't help it. They was worshiping with the very son of God. Nebuchadnezzar even knew that that was the son of God. He was a pagan. What are you saying? All they had control over was them. Just because all three of them wouldn't bow didn't mean that all three of them had to be thrown into the fire. Meshach and Abednego could have said, you know what, you're right, Nebuchadnezzar, and they could have bowed. You know why all three of them got thrown in? Because all three of them in their own heart purposed that they weren't going to bow to a false image of a man. It's not yesterday's generation's fault that we're in the way that we are today our fault we may not have caused it as Billy Joel said we may not have started the fire but the reason that the fire keeps burning is because people haven't turned in their heart and purpose to put it out to fight the fire to go against what's destroying us and instead embrace the only thing that can preserve us that would be God did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.